Hi, my name is Carlos Brito. I'm a chaplain and a captain at the United States in the United States Air Force, and I'm currently stationed at Pope Army Airfield in North Carolina, and I'm attached to the 21st Special Operation, I'm sorry, Special Tactics Squadron, which is a part of um, Air Force Special Operations Command. Uh, this morning, I'm gonna share a sermonette for your hearing, um, a little bit of an austere conditions, but hopefully you will get a appreciation for how I communicate uh, the Word of God to His people. I want to start off by asking a question. Who here loves a good story? I mean, we all like stories, right? I, I remember uh, first learning about stories and, and appreciating stories from my grandparents. And, and I loved those stories a lot because they were about my mother. And as little children, uh, we often think that our parents are perfect. And I came to find out just how imperfect my mother was through the stories that my grandparents told. I also remember being a young kid in elementary school, and they would have these storytelling competitions. And, and, and I would be rather shy, and so I wouldn't join them. But I had a friend who was really good at telling stories, and, and he won uh, one of the regional competitions, and he had this big trophy, and I really looked up to him. And it wasn't until I started studying the Word of God and listening to Jesus' stories that I really came to appreciate that Jesus indeed was probably the best storyteller in, the, in human history. I mean, his stories were powerful, and he knew how to tell the perfect story because Jesus knew how to use his surroundings. He knew how to use where the audience and his listeners were. He knew the audience and the listeners um, you know, um, intently, he knew their hearts, so he knew what they needed to, to, to hear, and more importantly, the stories he told left his listeners challenged and, and teased, if you will, wanting to know more. Uh, the fact that Jesus told many stories is very important because 33% of what Jesus shares in Scripture, you know, when you read the Bible and it's in red, 33% of what we have recorded Jesus saying is, uh, are, are through stories, or, or, or also known as parables. And they were very effective because Jesus would use word pictures rather than logic. And, and this is called um, stock images. And, and he used stock images of the day that would speak to the people of that day to get out a, a, a momentum, if you will, of God reaching people and people yearning to, uh, needing to know more about God through these stories. He was a master at expressing everyday um, life situation through vivid and oftentimes strange stories that left the hearers challenged. He, he, he was good because he was able to tell these stories and leave people wanting to know more about them. Um, our text today comes from one of Jesus' stories, one of Jesus' parables, and it's the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector out of Luke 18 verses 9 through 14. And in the parable it states, to some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told them this parable. There were two men walking to the temple, and they go to the temple, and one was a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He, even, he would not even look upon heaven, but he beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you this, Jesus says, rather than the other, I'm sorry, Jesus says in verse 14, I tell you this, that this man, rather than the other, who went, went home justified before God, for all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and all those who humble themselves will be exalted. exalted. In order for us to truly appreciate the story that I just read, we need to really bring it into modern life today. So if we're going to appreciate that and do that, we need to connect with the characters, and we need to bring those characters here today. So Jesus was talking to some people called Pharisees, and these Pharisees really trusted upon themselves, and they looked down at other people. These Pharisees were religious Jewish churchmen 
who kept the Jewish, Jewish law very closely. In today's world, Jesus would be addressing a group of very religious Christians, um, pastors, deacons, people of authority in church, who would look at others as if they were not good enough. They, they, were, they would be Christians who would um, boast in how they kept up with Christian religions, uh, uh, regulations and rituals. Their confidence would not be in God at all, but it would be on how well they were able to perform their Christian duties. Uh, this self-confidence uh, led them to disregard others and not care for others who didn't meet the standards that they thought they should be meeting. They would look down on people who we would call unsaved. They, they would look down on people who were probably, they thought were not saved enough or who didn't express their faith the same way that they, that they did this, the, to, this, to their standard. The, their attitudes would be filled with religious pride. And ironically, the story is about these Pharisees or these religious Christians who were praying in a temple, or for our case today, in a church. And this man, in particular, disregards God and his fellow human. Now, the tax collector is an interesting individual. He's, a, he's an interesting player in the story. In Jesus' time, the tax collector was probably the most hated man by the Jewish people because he was indeed Jewish, but he worked for the Roman government. And what he did was collect taxes for the government, but he didn't only collect them, he also charged a little bit more. So he was skimming off the top. So he was stealing from his own people. So indeed, he was one of the most hated men, a chief sinner among men. In today's world, the tax collector could be a... a underhanded politician or lawyer, a, a sex addict or, or a drug dealer. So let's take a look at their prayers and see what those prayers would sound like today from those different characters. If, if the dirty lawyer, let's say, were praying in church, he would be the tax collector in Jesus' story, and this is what he would say probably. God, please forgive me for being dirty and corrupt. I have sinned against you, Lord, and I have taken bribes because of that, and because of that, I have contributed to the imprisonment of innocent people while guilty people have gone free. I violated my code of ethics and I have taken advantage of those who do not know the law. So God, I ask for your forgiveness. I feel so bad for what I've done, I can't even look up at you. Now let's say the um, prayers were coming from a sex addict, a sex addict. Perhaps this would be part of the prayer. God, I ask you to please have mercy on me. I am a sinner who is addicted to pornography rather than being addicted to you and to your son, Jesus. I've heard how your son could quench my desire for love. So I ask you to please forgive me for turning to something else to fulfill me rather than turning to you. Lord, I feel ashamed. I feel so ashamed for what I've done that I can't even look upon you. I'm so broken, Lord. Please take this lust away from me. Our last, our last example Let's say that a drug dealer would be praying in the house of the Lord in church. Perhaps maybe this would be his prayer. God, please be graceful. Uh, please be gracious towards me. I am a sinner who has helped your people get addicted to drugs. I admit, Lord, I have sold drugs to pregnant mothers. I have sold them to children and, and to any and everyone who wanted them, just so I could simply make a dollar. God, I feel like I can't even be forgiven because of what I've done. And I can't even bring myself to look upon you. Please forgive me. So let's say that the religious Christian would be praying at the same time in church. Now, according to the story, maybe perhaps the prayer would go something like this. As he stood in contempt and proudly standing before the altar, he would say, God, I thank you that I am not like this one here, this dirty politician this porn addicted person or this drug dealer because I fast regularly. I always pay tithes and as a matter of fact, I give offerings on top of my tithes. I come to church every Sunday. I'm a regular at Wednesday night Bible studies, at church meetings, at functions. Every time the church is open, I am there. So God, I thank you that I'm not like these others. Now, interestingly, Jesus' verdict, according to his story, is that the dirty politician, the porn-addicted person, and the drug peddler would be the ones who would leave justified 
that day rather than the religious man. What we see here happening in the story, in this parable, is the reversal of human standards of approval and reward. This parable, as well as the ones that go before it, together in Luke, are what's called the Gospel of the Outcast. And, and what that means is that when you read through Luke, you see Jesus defending those who would be ridiculed by the religious people of his time. Because these religious peoples missed something that these outcasts were able to see and, they were, and, and were able to grasp. These individuals who were broken and, and, and down had a, a radical dependence on the grace of God. And we can see that expressed through their understanding of their own broken state and an honest recognition of how that bankrupt state measures up to the kingdom of God. In other words, they see themselves needing Jesus, need, I'm sorry, needing God more than anything else. So somehow the religious people of the day missed that. Somehow they were, they were um, so prideful that they missed uh, Jesus before them bringing the kingdom of God to them and I'm afraid that sometimes Christians especially those who are faithful in church uh, the, the ones who have a, um, a, a position on a board or on a committee or on a on a ministry miss that too it, it seems that sometimes there's this claim righteousness that Christians earn rather than living in a given righteousness, which is God's response to our confession and our repentance. Notice that in the parable that the only thing the tax collector asks for is for God to be merciful upon him. He didn't even know if, if God would hear his prayer. He, he didn't even know if God would be merciful upon him because he saw himself as a sinner. Jesus claims that the tax collector was forgiven and justified rather than the religious Pharisee. And this must have been a shock to the Pharisees who were listening to him. They could not imagine that there would be such a reversal of values. That Jesus says that the righteous man is godless and that the godless man is righteous. This is because the reality is, is that when these Pharisees stood in the temple, and before others, they justified themselves. And in them justifying themselves, they were, in essence, declining God's acceptance and, and declining his um, justification. But the reality is, is that God is the God of the desperate and the brokenhearted, and his merciful love is boundless to all who ask. So in, for, in order for us to not be like these Pharisees, not be just religious Christians. We have to readjust our thinking about our present attitude towards God. We have to readjust our present attitude towards sin. And we have to readjust our present attitude towards ourselves.